want to talk to you about latent failures. Now, the health and safety executive prosecute this under what's called HSG 65. This is a case from 99 where Jenny Morrison was stabbed to death. You can see the defense of the person who stabbed her. He said that God told him to do it. He was mentally ill. He was found at the scene with a carving knife. The carving knife he'd used was from the kitchen drawer in the council run establishment where he was looked after. There were questions asked during the inquest and one of the answers to the questions was management said, well, we couldn't lock the sharp knives away anyway because we try and encourage the service users to rehabilitate. Had we got the service user to cut a sandwich with a blunt knife, well, we fear it would have breached his human rights. What's your view on that? Nonsense, stupidity, isn't it? Have you ever come across these kind of statements before? Yeah, you can't touch, this is just when I'm getting my son ready for school every morning. <laughs> but you hear this human rights card, and I call it the get out of jail free card of the 2010s. If you don't want to do PA, if you don't want to do, I don't want to do that, it's against my human rights. And I, I still, I do a lot of public speaking, and one incident in particular sticks out in my mind. When I was doing a conference in Birmingham, and I was talking about something similar, a lady put a hand up and she said, I disagree with what you're saying, that would breach the child's human rights. I said, well, interesting you say that. My next three slides are all about human rights. Which article of the Human Rights Act are you referring to? She said, well, what do you mean? I said, are you talking about right to life, restriction of liberty? Tell me and I'll explain it to you. And she said, I don't know anything about that nonsense. I'm just telling you it's against the child's human rights. Afterwards, when I chatted to her, I found out she was a social worker. So she's educated, good job. You know, she's involved with policy and procedure. But she was doing what 99% of all other people do. She was coining a phrase. She's heard it somewhere and it sounds cool. So she's just throwing the human rights card out there. If nothing else, if you don't go away from here laughing at my jokes today, I want you to go away understanding the concept of human rights. So if anyone ever challenges you on it or asks you a question, you can do one of two things. You can silence them and get on with your job or you can have an educated discussion where you make them understand how the Human Rights Act works. So we're going to play, have I got human rights for you, okay? <laughs> I think we're all right on copyright. It's a little game I've put together which involved four cases from the media you may or may not remember, okay? So, top left, lady wanted to wear a cross for work. Who did she work for? She worked for British Airways. Her name was Nadia Ivida. What was she told by BA? She's told you can't wear a cross. Can you imagine being a non-Christian and having to look at such an offensive structure as a cross on someone's neck? Can you imagine that? That's what BA said. I'm not gonna give you the answers, I'm gonna give you the cases, give you a formula, and then you'll all understand why they ended the way they did. Who does the hook represent? Abu Hamza, yeah, so a, a radical extremist who um, we wanted to deport to his country of origin, which was Egypt, but we couldn't, there were issues. Now, first issue was America wanted to have a word with him, which is always concerning. The second issue was that if he did get deported to America or Egypt, there was a fear he wouldn't get a fair trial because evidence that had been gathered against him had been gathered by doing what to people? Torture. Torture against the Human Rights Act. We signed onto the treaty, so it meant we, we couldn't deport him. The credit cards represent a convicted paedophile called Christopher Prothero. He was released from prison. He made a freedom of information request and they found out that the police were monitoring his bank accounts, his internet search history, and his phone records. They wanted to see exactly what he was doing, exactly what he was looking at. He said it was an infringement of his human rights, and he took his case to the European court to get compensation and to have it stopped. Are we feeling angry yet? Yeah. Just want to build, boil you up a bit? Last one represents a hitman called Gilbert Winter. Now, Gilbert worked for the Clerkenwell Crime Syndicate. You may have heard the newspapers label them as the Adams family. He did his time as a hitman. He came out of prison and rival gangsters were talking in a pub about how they were going to kill him. Now he's been freed. Police surveillance officers were listening to those tapes and the police obviously had an obligation to protect his life. So an application was put in to put 24 hour armed protection of Gilbert to stop the other hitmen from assassinating. Bit angry yet? Okay, good. So there are your four cases. Bear them in mind, I want to give you a quick formula. There are three types of human rights. This was given to me by John Wadham, one of the top human rights lawyers in the country. 
When he gave me this formula, it simplified a lot of the things that I've been doing for the last few years. I spend a lot of time talking about local policy and guidance. We spend a lot of time referencing pieces from the Children's Act. If you look at the hierarchy of law, above all laws sits health and safety, but above all that sits the Human Rights Act. We can't pass a law in this country unless it complies with the Human Rights Act. So if somebody wants to play the human rights card, absolutely brilliant, because it means if you can talk to them with it, there isn't anywhere to go. You start with children's legislation, you can always go back to human rights, but if you understand it and are able to explain it, this is a formula to use. So three types of human rights. We've got absolute, qualified. Does anyone know what the last one is? They're limited rights. So limited rights apply to governments in times of war. So for example, we're not big on slavery. We don't, we're passing another modern slavery bill soon. If there's a war tomorrow, what will happen to everybody in this room? Yeah, exactly. We'll be forced to do certain things to, to protect our country. So they'll keep that in mind. Absolute rights, they follow the Ron Seal rule. So they do exactly what they say on the tin. So the first one, the prohibition of torture. We all picked up on it when we talked about the Abu Hamza case. We don't torture people under any circumstances. So even if somebody comes forward and they've got information which would be in the interest of national security, we can't be seen to torture them at all. If you believe what you read in the Daily Mail, we fly them somewhere else, torture them for us and they fly them back. But I don't know if that's true. So the other one, the right to life. This means that no one can take your life away unless you've been sentenced to death by a court. Now we don't have the death penalty. So how does that work? What's it unlawful to assist someone to do in this country? assisted suicide so that's how it works the other thing it does is it places a positive obligation on the state to preserve life so where there's a known risk to life so for example busy roads we put speed cameras where there's a risk of fire we put fire exits so because we're a developed country that signed onto the treaty you'll see all these safeguards in place we, we call it health and safety red tape and the last one is the right to hold a religious belief that means you can believe in any religion you want to, and here's the cool bit, you can even make one up. And if two other people believe in it, it's a recognized religion. So since the last census, what have we now got a lot of people who claim their religion is? Any Jedi's present? <laughs> no, excellent. I don't know what the sign is. So there you three. So why have you come to a conference at a police station? Why is there somebody talking to you about paedophiles, gangsters and terrorists? Let me explain why. The next time you hear somebody play that human rights card or the next time a member of staff is accused of doing something inappropriate because they've broken up a fight, put their hands on someone or held someone to calm them down, ask yourself this. Is the child dead? Has anyone been torturing them? Are you telling them they can't be a Christian or they can't be a Muslim? Because unless it fits into one of those three categories, they're not talking about absolute rights. What they're accusing you of doing is taking away a qualified right, which you're perfectly entitled to do if you're protecting an absolute right. So just, just a quick consensus in here. Would anybody put their hands on a child forcibly unless the child was trying to harm themselves, harm someone else, or damage something? Not realistic. You're not going to. Well, that fits into there. You know, torture is abuse, harm and risk to life would be something like going onto a busy main road. So let's talk about some of these. Child's right to education and play. We want every child to be in the classroom. We want every child to go out at break time. But if they're in a classroom and they're acting indecently, exposing themselves or using inappropriate sexual language, that fits into torture. So they get taken out of the class. We've got powers to do that. Playtime, primary school, let's get all the kids out. It's fine, they can go on the playground. If you've got a child who keeps scaling the fence and running onto the busy main road, should we expose them to that risk? No, until we've got the necessary measures in, either big offences or appropriate supervision, then you can take that away from them. But I see so many organisations that are terrified, oh, we have, to do, we have to leave the doors unlocked. We have to do what? We have to leave the doors unlocked, it's imprisonment. Well, realistically, the right to liberty has only ever been a qualified right. So you can take away someone's liberty to protect them. Think about it, in a nursery, they don't leave the doors open, do they? In a, a care home, for example, somebody who lacks capacity, they'll keep an eye on them. They'll maybe take away walking aids so they can't wander off outside. I did some consultancy for a, a company in Lancashire who were told by the local authority um, that they had to cut the belts off any wheelchairs they used. So when I asked them why, they said, oh, because it's a restriction of liberty. Well, then when I pointed out to them, if they hit a bump, they're going to launch the person they had to sort of go back. But people put these 
strange rules in to protect people, but it's got that opposite effect very often. And the last one I want to talk about, there's lots of other qualified ones, you can look this up yourselves, the right to manifest your religious belief. Now this is a contentious one. So give, let me give you two global examples. So religious belief, it sits inside your head, it can't offend anybody. The moment you ma let it manifest itself, only ever qualified. So the Abu Dhabi national women's football team, you may not have heard of them, they only started playing professional matches last September. That's because the ladies on the team said, we'll play, but we want to wear our abaya, which is the head robe, which leaves the face open and wraps around the neck. And the FA said, we don't have a problem with your religious belief, but you're expressing it and putting people's lives at risk. Someone could pull it, it could choke you, so you're not playing. Now it was only when the Prince of Abu Dhabi introduced a Velcro attachment that they're now allowed to play. Boxers, have you ever seen a professional boxer with a beard? If you have, they're very close to the face so you can see any cuts. So any blood-borne viruses won't be spread. They can cover them, they can make sure people are protected. So some people will say, I grow a beard to express my religion. That's absolutely fine. But the moment you want to step into the professional boxing arena, you'll be handed the clippers. And if you refuse, you won't enter into the competition. So on a global level, it's ruled with an iron fist. But on a local level, people are terrified of human rights. They don't understand it. They'd rather protect someone's beliefs or expression of religion than stopping them from injuring people or putting lives at risk. So the four cases, let's talk about how they ended. Nadia Ravida, she was told by the Supreme Court, the highest court in England, you can't wear your cross. She went to Europe and the European judge, does anyone know what the judge told her? You can wear it and if anyone's offended by it, tell them not to look at it. Does that make perfect sense? Of course it makes sense. Two other cases failed. One was a nurse, one was someone who worked in a factory. Why did they fail? Right to life. It was the fact that it was an item of jewellery, not about the message that it was sending. Abu Hamza, now you'll have seen this in the media, there was obviously massive controversy, we had real problems to deport him. Those of you that aren't aware, he's now serving life, and I think life is more likely to mean life in America, um, because we deported him there, and he, he, was, he stood trial there first. So we had these issues that torture was going to be used. How did we get round it? This is how we got round it. We got a letter from the King of Egypt, and we got a letter from the US State Department, which said that he would get a fair trial. So I'm sure it'd be fine. Christopher Prothero, um, he went to Europe as well to fight his right to privacy because he didn't want people looking at what he was seeing on the internet and he didn't want people seeing what he was spending his money on. I can see some of you getting really angry just me talking about this. Christopher was told that the police will continue to monitor him until he proves to us that he's not a danger. Does that make sense? Yeah. Every 15 years. So he's on, the, on it for 15 years, then they'll check to see if he's a danger because realistically, torture, right to life, their absolute rights. Right to privacy goes out of the window in those circumstances. Gilbert Winter, who's now been assassinated, which is irony for you, he received 120,000 pounds of taxpayers' money to provide armed protection of him in one month. The protection only stopped when he made a request that the officers left him alone. Think about it, if you're a hitman and the police are following you, one, it's gonna ruin your street cred, and two, you're not gonna get much work done, are you really? So where does, it, um, where does it come from? It comes from the best interest and it all s stems down to people being scared that if you do put your hands on somebody, you're going to get accused of assault. And this boils back to things like um, Tony Martin. Do you all remember the Tony Martin case? So this was a case that was widespread in the media. It was a Norfolk farmer, for those of you who don't remember, who shot a burglar completely in self-defense, the newspapers would have us believe it, and it was a travesty and injustice and we should have all put out pictures with newspapers with red tops and put his face in our windows. If you look at the actual facts behind the case, we've got Tony Martin, who shot somebody called Fred Barris, who was 16. So in the eyes of the law, what does that make him? It makes him a child, doesn't it, in the, in the definition of the Children Act. Whereabouts did Fred get shot on his body? And where was he? He wasn't in his house. He was also shot with an unlicensed firearm. So he didn't have a license for the firearm, and there's two witnesses who heard him say, I'm going to shoot him, in the pub the night before. So realistically, you add all those things up, and, uh, but again, why let the facts get in the way of a good story? We can put some adverts for burglar alarms and static security services next to this story. 
So because of that, whenever I travel around and talk about use of force, people say, oh, but you can't do anything because of X, Y, and Z. So I've scared you a bit with the Corporate Manslaughter Act. I want to reassure you now with some, some guidelines that are out there. So the Crown Prosecution Service, all heard of them? Yeah, they decide if it's in the public interest to prosecute people. These are their stand charging guidelines. So this is what they have to follow. So you've spoken, you've uh, explained what you did, police have given it to the CPS, they're the ones that make the decision. And they say that when somebody who's engaged in a crime themselves, so harm to self, harm to others, damage to property, we've already established that, they must take particular care. Goes on to say that where the use of force is reasonable, you have an absolute defence and charges should not be brought. Do we all understand what that word reasonable means? Reasonable force. So if you don't, we'll touch on it in a short while. This is Professor Gary Slapper. Okay. Somebody said on the last, somebody said, I feel sorry for him. Somebody then said, I feel more sorry for his wife. <laughs> now, Gary would laugh at that. Um, Gary Slapper, Michael Mansfield and John Wadham, some of the top lawyers in the country. Now, um, we travel around, people ask us questions, we give them our opinion, our professional opinion. Sometimes people don't follow that opinion. So what we did was we sat down, we spent quite a lot of money and we interviewed them. And we asked them the questions that people ask us, one, to confirm we were correct, and two, so that they can argue with them instead of us. Now, one interesting thing I want to bring up with you today is what Gary told us about statistics. He gave us some statistics over a 15 year period where the CPS tell us there were 20 million crimes. Now that's all crimes, everything from fraud, right through to armed robbery, rape, every, every crime out there. And we asked him how many people actually get prosecuted when they've defended themselves, but then they've gone too far. So they've said, look, it was the case of a mugging, it was the case of a, a restraint, it was the case of something where they were acting innocently and they've been told they went too far. And there were 11 prosecutions. Now, I didn't believe that, but I looked into it, and it's entirely true. So why have you not heard these statistics? I'll tell you why, because it's not what sells newspapers. What sells newspapers are teachers, care staff, police officers, door supervisors, all being absolutely terrified. I, don't, I, need to, I need someone to tell me what to do. We need changes in the guidance. We don't need any changes in the law. The law is absolutely fine. We need better education on what the law says so people can pass it on, people can understand and protect themselves. Even these prosecutions, I looked at one of them and I don't think it should be on there. One of them involves a homeowner who chased after the burglar, caught him, brought him back to a separate location, so not even his house, trussed him up in a carpet, poured petrol on him and set fire to him. Now, in my eyes, that, that shouldn't be in the self-defense statistics. That should be, should be somewhere else completely. Has anybody heard of this before? Now, if you're involved with working with children, at some point, you will have to write up incident report forms. So I just want to bring this to, to your attention. Very often, I look at reports that have been written where people have written as if they've had hindsight. So we get something there. Today, I bruised Jonathan's arm when I broke up the play fight. If it had been a play fight, would that teacher have broken it up? No. So why are you writing it? If it, it? People look for loopholes and you see it all the time. And very often it's not prosecutions, it's insurance companies. So insurance companies contact people like me and they say, you know those reports you write for court? Write one based on this. I know what they're going to do with it. They're going to use it as a, a leverage tool. They're going to say, look, this is what would happen if you went to court. Come with us now and settle for five, settle for £7,000 outside of court. So honestly held belief, let me give you a scenario. I'm gonna walk out of here shortly. You all get your memory sticks, we all get on the M6. I say as I'm walking to my car, I hear a scream. Look to my left and I see a woman. She's very slight, very petite. She's got long hair down to her waist and she's being dragged along the floor. There's a man slapping her around the face. Now this man, he's, he's enormous. He's twice my size. He's one of those men that don't appear to have a neck. They've just got a beef burger on the back of the head. It's enormous. <laughs> I'm not about to start negotiating with him. So no one around to help me. I see the woman's in danger. So I run over and I kick him as hard as I can in his shin. He instantly lets go. He's in pain. He's rolling around on the floor. So I try and help the woman to make her escape. Are you okay? She says, no, I'm not okay. I said, well, what do you mean? I've just saved you from that man. She said, that man's my boyfriend. I said, but he's beating you up. She said, I asked him to do it to me. I actually quite like it. Don't know what goes on in Cheshire. I just stay up in Lancashire. 
That man's already on the phone. He's already calling the police. Now the question isn't, will I get arrested? Because people get arrested to preserve evidence, get statements, there's lots of other reasons behind that. The question is, am I guilty of assaulting that man? No, why not? This is what the law says. The law says that a person defending themselves, they can't weigh up exactly how much force to use. As long as you did what you honestly and instinctively thought was necessary, that's your post potent evidence. Even if your belief was a mistaken one, and even if your mistake was an unreasonable one, that fits into the criteria of honestly held belief. Now I quite like this because whenever I talk to people, there's this misconception that, oh, if you ever do put your hands on a child, just do it really gently. And you know, if they're attacking you, they've got their hands around your neck and they're trying to kill you, just do this and push them off. And we sit there and I think, what an absolute load of nonsense people are being told. Because realistically, a child, someone under the age of 18, very often they're stronger than most adults. And if we think about when your brain stops forming, sort of 19 and 21, gender respective, we've got this adult physique, strong, maybe due to the influence of drugs, maybe who lifts weights, maybe who's experiencing some kind of martial art, attacking a teacher. You've got the hands, hands around the neck. It says there, as long as you did what you honestly and instinctively felt was necessary, there's your most potent evidence. It'd be lovely to say, let's just hold them gently. There was an incident where a teacher restrained a child outside a primary school. A doctor examined the child afterwards and the child needed seven stitches in his neck. Now you think to yourself, how on earth did that teacher restrain that child where he cut his neck open near a major artery? The teacher had been on bus duty. The child ran out into the road. He grabbed his hood, dragged him backwards, and the zip cut his neck open. Was that in the child's best interest? So is that teacher guilty of assault? Very often, that's what I'm faced with. People, there's an injury, there's a bone broken, there's a mark. Somebody needs to, to face a firing squad for this. Employment Rights Act 1996 says you cannot be disciplined or dismissed for defending yourselves or others in circumstances of serious or imminent danger. So by all means, let's investigate, let's look into injuries to children, but let's not start sacking people or discipline them. Because if you do, it's against the law. There's a framework there to protect staff. This takes me on to another interesting point. Single person interventions. That's just you restraining a child on your own. What's your thoughts on it? Does it happen? If it does happen and it's instinctive, the law's there to protect you. But if we have any level of hindsight, should we be doing it? Well, the, an the answer is no, we, we need to try and avoid it. We're back to risk assessment. We're looking at avoidance strategies if we can. So the first thing I'd say is, there's a risk to yourself. There's a risk that you could get harmed. Is that right? You've got five weapons, your arms, your legs, and your head. So is the child. And that's a colleague of mine demonstrating a single person restraint. I know for a fact that, that they're out there, people are still teaching them. It's a little bit more than it just being bad practice. There's a risk to other students. Let's say you've got control of a class and one child starts acting out, you, you go to restrain him. Who's then looking after the rest of the children? Yes, you've got a power to intervene, but you choose to use your powers. You have a duty of care to yourself and all those other children in the classroom. Your duty is absolute, so you must fulfill that duty. If you try and exercise your power and you fail, you failed in your duty, haven't you? There's a risk to the child. If there's two of you, you both take hold of an arm each, you stand on either side of the child and you concentrate on not getting headbutted, not getting bitten, not getting kicked. It's just you and the child Realistically, how are you going to hold them? You're going to have to hold them more forcibly. The last two I want to put together, okay? Motor skills and health and safety. So, health and safety. Has everybody seen a TV program called Jeremy Kyle? Yeah. You love it or you hate it. I can see some of the looks. And it's not enough of an excuse to say, I'm only watching it till Loose Women comes on. Okay, that isn't a, a, a get out clause. So who watches Jeremy Kyle? Not a show of hands. Who watches? Now I've done some research and I can tell you who's watching Jeremy Kyle, okay? So here we go. This is the stereotyping section. Students, they're watching Jeremy Kyle because there's nothing else to watch, okay? Housewives, house husbands, people who don't work, people who work shifts and people who are injured. Now, where am I basing my statistics on? I'll tell you how I'm basing my statistics by watching the advert breaks. So the advert breaks go like this, Foxy Bingo. Logbook loans, K 
cash for gold, and above all else, no win, no fee. Look at the adverts on daytime TV. You've got about six adverts in any advert break. Have you had an accident? Do you want us to make it look like you've had an accident? All these weird and wonderful strategies. We'll give you an iPad. We'll give you a cash advance. They just want that phone call. Now, I'm less in the interest because I, I work for some of these companies. They ask me for reports and I provide them on a professional basis. So I'll give you an example. Let's step out of education. Let's go into care. You've got somebody who works in care. They've slipped on a wet floor. They've hurt the back. They phone up Mr. No Win, No Fee and they say, I want that free iPad. I've had an accident. Okay. Where did you slip on the floor? I remember it vividly. I slipped next to the yellow sign that said wet floor. That's where they should hang up. Do they? No, because they have to fill out a form. Or well, the people on the telly sales, they have to take them to a series of questions. Could this accident have been prevented? Were there any other incidents which led up to this? What other work activities do you do? Well, in a care home, well, I feed the residents, um, I change them, I take them for walks, and I sometimes lift them in and out of beds. Bang, they know they've got a prosecution. How do you get people in and out of beds in a care home? With hoists, a mechanical method. So we've got something which has been established as best practice, which everybody's using. Also, if you're lifting something, you have to follow the manual handling regulations. So we've all done this. Talk me through it. I'm going to lift something. I need to bend my knees, back straight, keep the load close to your body. Don't twist your trunk. Feet face the same way as your shoulders. And don't attempt to lift anything heavier or lesser than this that you can manage than what weight? 25 kilos, okay? So, quick question, the children you deal with in your schools, do they weigh more than 25 kilos? Absolutely. Is restraint classed as a manual handling activity? Well, I'll answer that for you. The health and safety executive tell us that it is. So I know for a fact some people have said, oh, just, we do it like this, we hold them like that. You can do, but it, it's not lawful because it's breaching. Let's say it happens, a child's falling backwards, a child's running in the road, you instinctively see something, you've covered, you've seen that in the law. But realistically, if you've got time to plan, and restraint should be a planned activity, then you've got time to try and avoid it as well. So, reasonable force, this is why I'm here, this is what we're boiled down to. So if you get my stories about terrorists, you forget my bad jokes, none of it matters. This slide's what matters. And you've all got it written down in front of you. So, can we explain reasonable force? There's a lot of people out there that will say, oh, reasonable force, it's a bit of a grey area. Reasonable force is black and white. You're guilty or you're not guilty. Even if you admit a caution for it, it's an admission of guilt. So it's going to be reasonable or it's going to be unreasonable. So what tests can we apply? We can apply two tests. The first one is, is it necessary for us to use force? So do we need to do it? Now there's two questions. It might be you asking yourself, do I need to intervene? Or it may be the fact that somebody's come to your office and said, I've just had to do this. Your first question will be, did you need to do it? If we don't need to put our hands on somebody, should we? <coughs> no, absolutely not. The second test is proportionality. So the best way to define this is to say to yourself, if I'd stood there and let happen what was going to happen, what harm would have been caused? In my mind, what's the likely harm? So if I'd left the child's arms around my neck, if I'd left them to sink their teeth into that person's arm, or if I'd let them run out of that door, what harm could have been incurred? As long as the harm you've caused is less or equal to what you perceive would have happened, then it's, it's proportionate. So let me give you a definition. Here's an example. True life scenario, we've got a boy on the second floor of a hospital. The boy tries to jump out the window, Below him was a concrete pavement which could have seriously injured or it could have killed him. Maybe that hospital food, we don't know. The staff try and stop him and in doing so they break the boy's arm. Now on none of the courses I teach do we show you how to break a child's arm. It's just not in there. However, the, the staff did it and there's this miss, oh it's not a recognised, you've not done a recognised technique. There's no such thing as an illegal or, or a le legal technique. It's all circumstantial anyway. So the staff did do it. So let's be expert witnesses for a minute because it's quite easy to do. And if you work for the right organizations, it's very well paid. Was it necessary to do something? Yeah. Was what they caused to the child better than what would have happened? Yeah. Absolutely, then it's justified. So, but somebody's broke a child's arm, we need to suspend them from work. No, you don't. You need to look into it and you need to be careful, both for the safety of the child, but also for the well-being of the staff. It's a traumatic incident for them in the first place. We don't want to discipline them unnecessarily. Um, potentially end up in a tribunal. 
So I talked to you before about motor skills. I just want to break them down for you a little bit here. Um, the some of the restraint uh, methods I see, because my job is to look at whether staff have been trained properly. So I would get sent the manual that people have worked from and uh, I'd have a look through it to see if it's the staff's fault or if it's the training system that was flawed because it upsets me when people say, well, it was you should have done what we showed you. Well, they should have done, but if it's too complicated for them to manage, they're not going to be able to do it. So for example, fine motor skills, things like playing the piano, if somebody stood behind you shouting at you, making you feel stressed, you won't be able to do it. Moderate motor skills, things like basketball, football, running around these active activities. Now think about it, if you, the England football team, for example, if you watch them in practice, watch their penalty scoring ability. They're brilliant, they're one of the best teams in the world. But if you take England and put them in front of a crowd, on a qualifying match, what happens on penalties? We go to pieces because you can't do moderate motor skills whilst you're under stress. So all you're left with are gross motor skills. Has anybody in here ever scared a baby before? <laughs> what do you do for fun in Cheshire? <laughs> what, do you, what happens when you scare a baby? I shut, startle response like that. And I've, since I was four years old, I've done martial arts, I've worked in uh, court enforcement, I've worked as a door supervisor, I've worked in lots of different roles where I've had to use force, and now I teach it day in, day out. But this weekend, I'll be at home, and at some point, my 10-year-old son will go missing. I'll shout his name, and he won't be there. Usually, when I round the corner to the kitchen, he jumps out at me. And you know all my years of martial arts training? What will I do? I'll do the scared baby, because that's what everybody else does. Then, then I'll react. No, I don't do that anymore. Now. Why then am I auditing training systems that are three or four days long with 50 techniques in the system with staff saying this, right, figure one of 15, put your knee at a 45 degree angle. Figure two, you've lost me because I've already done this and I'm all over the place. That's not the staff member's fault. That's because they've been shown something that's, that's not correct. So, telling you about my son, here's a picture of him. Uh, this is Ryan, he's 10 in, in April. Uh, does anyone know what he's got in his hand? Yeah, mackets, that's right. So I used to go fishing as a kid and I used to absolutely love it. And stopped going fishing when I was about 15, found other things to do. Later on, son came along, thought, right, it's time to get him back into fishing. So I went along, bought the rod, bought some maggots. I opened the maggots, has anyone smelt them? They're nauseating, aren't they? Now when I smelt the maggots, I wasn't nauseated. I actually got this feeling of euphoria. It made me feel happy from smelling the maggots. And it was because as a child, I'd had lots of happy experiences whilst I was, I was fishing. Now you've all had that happen before, maybe not with stinky maggots, but maybe it's happened because a song came on the radio or you smelt something and uh, you, heard, you heard a noise, it reminds you of a holiday you went on or the smell reminds you of bonfire night. And that happens because of your amygdala, a part of your brain which initially scans for threats, it protects us, but it also makes emotions and it maps them to things that have happened. So again, I go and talk to organisations about restraints and I try and say to them, try, let's stay away from things like floor restraints. Let's stay away from these single person restraints. Yes, it's because it could be unlawful. There's a bit more to it than that. We have to consider taking hold of somebody and wrapping our arms around them or holding them on the floor. And we have to consider other aspects, such as torture. Now, let's say you're a child who's gone through some kind of trauma early on in life physical or sexual, and somebody puts you in a similar position than you were put in by your abuser. Your amygdala is going to switch on and one of two things will happen. You'll either become very stressed, excited, delirium, which can risk positional asphyxia, or you're going to become very, very upset. And that fits into torture. And what have we all learned today about torture? It's an absolute right. So things like broken bones, broken arms, we, we can all talk about reasonable force and you understand the rules on reasonable force, but when it comes to restraint, it, it can be a first resort because it could be instinctive, but realistically we should try and make it a last resort. And we should say, just because we have the power to put our hands on someone or remove someone from a class, we've got to ask ourselves, is it absolutely necessary? If it's not necessary, then we don't do it because it doesn't fit into reasonable force. So who's ultimately responsible? I just want to draw your attention. I, I spend a lot of time uh, communicating with government departments. If I don't feel they've explained something correctly, I'll try and get them to, um, to come back and, and tell me what it means. So first of all, the Department for Education, they've said that a training provider, if you choose a training provider, it should be the school that decides it. 
They've actually said that they're going to give head teachers the freedom to use their expert judgment and take the liability realistically. So what kind of things do we need to look for when we're, we're sort of procuring training and things like that? I went to a conference last year with the sole intention of speaking to this man. He's one of the top barristers in the country who deals with reasonable force. And I asked him if a school, care home or hospital, contracting a company in to provide training, uh, and that training failed, or it wasn't fit for purpose, or for example, something that was inadequate, who would be liable? And his answer was it would be the school. He said, even though they've, they've contracted someone in. So what I've done is I've put together a list. Now, as an expert witness, I thought it'd be really glamorous. I thought that I'd get to wear fancy suits and it'd be like my cousin Vinny or some John Grisham book or something. Realistically, the only time someone tries to get me to court is to discredit me. So I've been to court four times in my expert witness capacity and every time I've answered questions on my CV, where I went to university and what courses I've done and on what date I did them because they just want to discredit me so that my report is struck off. So I went to um, and made sure I got a lot of health and safety qualifications. So health and safety law tells us that when we're, when we're procuring a contractor, we have to follow certain criteria. So first thing we should ask for is a copy of the health and safety policy. Um, we want feedback and testimonials. We also want risk assessments of the training and techniques. If the techniques that have been used aren't, aren't risk assessed, then they're not safe. You also want a copy of the risk assessment qualification. How can somebody do a risk assessment if they're not qualified to do so? There's courses out there through IOSH and environmental health that qualify you to do it, show you how to do it properly. Details of emergency procedures, first aid qualifications. First aid's really important. I don't think people should be considering restraining people unless they're trained in first aid because a restraint situation can quickly become an emergency situation. Details of health and safety training provided. Um, copies of insurance, CV and relevant professional qualification details. When you're taking a contractor on, they must, by law, have professional qualifications to do what they're doing. There are qualifications out there in restraint, there's qualifications out there in risk assessment, so ask for them. And if organisations haven't got them, realistically, we have to ask ourselves if, if they're safe. And last of all, schemes of work and session plans. Has anyone got any questions? No, right, let's just confirm some under... Yes? I have got one. Quite often, um, I've experienced when people write to the school... Oh, yes, yeah. Um, do they have to go to the head teacher? Can it be the individual teacher? There was actually a section on search in this PowerPoint, which I'm happy to share with you all. I took it out because of the time constraints. Realistically, the power to search is given by the head teacher. If the head teacher hasn't given you authority, you have no authority to do so. My advice would be, if a head teacher does give you authority, ask for the policy, because you shouldn't be carrying out something unless you've been told how to do it. The other thing with search, this infuriates me a bit. A lot of people say to me, um, we're following the government guidelines on search. So we get the, um, the child, we make sure they're on, on camera, we have a member of staff and a female member of staff and we search them. If you've got a non-consensual, so you don't need consent, power of search, and you want to look in someone's bag or their coat, when's the best time to do it? When they're not there. So when they're in PE, or maybe you turn the temperature up in the classroom, then have a fire drill, then look in the coats, because they're taking the coats off because it's warm. I'm just thinking outside the box here. As long as you document it, the law is clear, you do not need consent for a list of items. Some examples are things like tobacco, cigarette paper, pornography, that's even digital pornography, knives. Um, there's, a, there's an exhaustive list that the government have given us. But the answer to your question is, um, you would be authorised and then you'd have a policy. Your policy shouldn't be go and ask for permission before you search though. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. I mean, our policy is to always check what the reasonable grounds are for our That's right. and the head would then, and our head normally asks for student's consent. Yeah. And most students will consent to that anyway. Yeah, if it was safe to do so. If you can ask a child to consent for, any, for anything that's banned by the school rules. So if you want to ban Justin Bieber merchandise, that's absolutely fine. But you can't start pinning children to the floor looking for, for photographs. It, it has to fit onto that, that list of exhaustive things. The reason that the government have pulled back on this use of force of, for knives and things like that, consider it. If you say to a child, I'm going to search you for a knife, 
There's two risks. The one's clear. Anne McGuire was stabbed to death last year in an unprecedented incident. She was stabbed in a classroom. So we know there's a risk that the child could use the knife on you. What's the other risk? You're a child, you've got a knife with you. You don't want the teacher to find it whilst you're being searched. Where are you going to put it? You're gonna put it down your underwear. So you get searched, they're never gonna find it. You go back to your classroom and you sit down. Think about it, your femoral arteries run down either side of your thigh. There's a real risk that you could quite easily cut an artery. Looking at corporate manslaughter, if a search like that was carried out and the child died, who would be liable? It could be the organisation. So again, what they always say is, if there's a risk that the knife could be used or weapon could be used, then the, the police should be called. Same with drugs, I'd say, because the child can try and consume the drugs to, to hide them. Any further questions? Yes, that's right. And, and best practice to have someone there with you. Yeah, the government have actually, on the, de on the government uh, Department for Education website, they've got some really good guidance on methods to search, approaches to search. So if you're going for a consensual search, follow those down to a T. But if you have reasonable grounds, and there's, there's information out as well, then you don't need consent. No, no, because the right to privacy is what kind of a human right? It's a qualified right. So you'd have to have reasonable grounds that somebody's life or limb was at risk, so it fits into torture or the right to life. And that formula I gave you, it's a good way to explain to parents or even children, for example. So if somebody had been searched and they found out, then that, that would be a, a good defence. So we've talked about human rights. Yes? Sorry, can I ask about how you left one Yes, I can send you one. Yeah, that's absolutely fine, yeah. Um, as a, I'm a health and safety consultant, I would never write a school's policy for them. What I'm always happy to do is just comment on it. And I'd say, if you've got a policy on anything, ask a health and safety consultant. It doesn't have to be me. There are other, are other health and safety consultants available. You can ask them just to give their view on it. And uh, the thing with policies is, have, diff have versions. So version one, version 1.2, April, May, blah, blah, blah. So it shows where you've made the changes that does look better shows it's a work in progress so many schools just oh we haven't got a policy can you write it for us well you must have something and, and we'll work from the ground upwards on that so quick confirmation of understanding how many types of human rights have you got what are we concerned with two so give me some absolute rights right to life right not to be tortured right to be a jedi reasonable force how would you explain reasonable force yeah, must be necessary than proportionate. You can't start explaining why it was proportionate if it wasn't necessary. So always make sure people understand that if it was unnecessary to use force, doesn't matter how big they are, what they've got in the hand, there was, there was no need to, to use it. If any of you at the test show or the education show on Wednesday onwards, I'm uh, speaking there and we, we've also got stands. You've all got lots of information there. If there's any questions you didn't want to ask, I'm around at the end or I'm happy for you to email me. Thank you very much.